Hello, and welcome to today's lecture on Aphrodite. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we are going to talk about the goddess of love. But what we're going to learn is that the ancient Greeks thought that passionate, romantic love was something to be feared rather than fostered. So whether you're looking for love or just here for the saucy stories, journey with me as we investigate Aphrodite, goddess of love. Aphrodite, known as Venus in Roman mythology, is immediately recognizable in visual depictions as the nude goddess, sometimes trying to cover her reproductive organs. Whereas Athena has her helmet and spear, and Artemis has her bow, Aphrodite has, well, other features. Depending on which origin story you go with, Aphrodite was either the daughter of Zeus and Dione, or emerged from the blood of Uranus's castrated phallus. Her offspring, on the other hand, are more frequently associated with love than blood. The Erotes are little winged men, not babies as depicted in Roman mythology, who aid in the process of falling in love. Hothos represents longing, Hemeros represents desire, and Eros himself is indeed the god of love. Aphrodite also gave birth to Patho, the goddess of persuasion, and while that concept may seem romantic, we'll get to some alternative interpretations in just a bit. Finally, Aphrodite was mother to Aeneas, a heroic mortal who eventually founded the line that gave birth to the Roman Empire. Now, Aphrodite is specifically worshipped in Corinth, the major city that connects Attica, where Athens is, uh, to the Peloponnese, where Sparta is. And she's worshipped there because that was known as a hotbed of prostitution in the ancient world. Moreover, she's also worshipped on the island of Kithara, one of her birthplaces according to one of the, uh, the ancient stories, and then also the island of Cyprus. And that's where, uh, according to Hesiod, uh, Uranus's giant phallus fell into the sea just off the coast. And you can still see that place if you go to Cyprus today. Uh, it's known as Petria to Romeo, and you can go there and swim out to the Rock of Aphrodite where she was born. One of Aphrodite's most famous myths all begins with an apple and a wedding. The Greek hero Peleus was getting married to the sea goddess Thetis, and everyone was invited. Everyone except Ares, goddess of discord. But Ares sent along a gift anyway, a golden apple with a single word on it, Kalisti, which translates as, for the fairest. The young Trojan prince Paris had to decide which goddess to give this to. Hera, who would make him lord of Europe and Asia, Athena, who would give him wisdom and skill at war, or Aphrodite, who would give him the hottest babe in all the land. Paris, like any short-sighted man, chose Aphrodite, later heading to Sparta to abduct, or seduce depending on your interpretation, Helen, who was the wife of King Menelaus. The entire Trojan War is the story of the Greeks trying to retrieve Helen from inside the walls of Troy. Now, one of the really interesting things here is that this story is never told in the Iliad. Uh, in fact, the Iliad itself, the Iliad and the Odyssey, are just two parts of a much larger epic cycle, eight tales in total that tell the entire story of the Trojan War. And the first one is called the Cypria, named after Cyprus, which is related as the birthplace of Aphrodite, hence the, uh, the name, um, and that's where we get the story of the Judgment of Paris. Now, while the story of Helen of Troy is certainly an epic tale of heroism, violence, and death, it also provides some real insight into the tensions surrounding the Greek conception of marriage. Essentially, basing a marriage on the emotions that Aphrodite 
and the erotes inspire is not a particularly good idea. Marriage in ancient Greece was usually based not on love, but on familial alliances. And so women like Helen often didn't have much of a say. And the idea is that if you did base marriage on things like love and looks and lust, well, that might just get you embroiled in a 10 year long war. And this is where the idea of patho or persuasion, we might also translate as like agreeable compulsion comes into play. The idea that if you're a woman, even if you're maybe not romantically in love with your husband, you go along with it for the greater good of your family and of society uh, more generally. While Aphrodite may be beautiful, she's not above getting a little jealous. Living in Paphos, a city on the island of Cyprus, the young woman Mira wasn't worshiping Aphrodite properly. And as a result, the goddess of love makes her fall in love with her own father. And she tricks her dad into intercourse. Eesh. After this unnatural union, her father chases her, sword in hand. And after fleeing for nine straight months, the gods take pity and turn Mira into a tree. The Mir tree. Now, as a tree, Mira gives birth to a young boy named Adonis, a beautiful young boy. And as Aphrodite's watching on, trying to ensure that everything's going according to plan, she accidentally gets pricked by one of Eros's arrows, thus falling in love with the young Adonis. But soon Adonis meets a grisly end, killed by a wild boar. Some say it was sent by Artemis, jealous of Adonis's hunting skills. Others say it was sent by Ares, jealous of Aphrodite's desire for Adonis. Either way, Aphrodite was heartbroken. Mixing Adonis' blood with nectar, the drink of the gods, Aphrodite created the beautiful anemone flower. And this is where we get the Adonia, one of Aphrodite's main rituals. Now, during this ritual, women would plant uh, small, very fast blooming and fast dying flowers. And these flowers represented the beautiful uh, Adonis and Aphrodite's love for him, which bloomed very, very quickly, but died equally as quickly. And to cap it all off, they eventually stage a mock funeral, uh, symbolizing the death of Adonis. Mythology surrounding Eros, the son of Aphrodite, is equally as revealing about the issues of love, seduction, and heartbreak. Once again, it begins with a beautiful woman, Psyche, this time living on the island of Sicily. Now, Psyche's just a regular mortal woman, and not a particularly boastful one at that. But she's just so dang beautiful that all the men start paying attention to her and start neglecting their worship of Aphrodite. So to get revenge, Aphrodite sends her son Eros to go shoot Psyche uh, with one of his magical arrows, making her fall in love with the ugliest dude around. But clumsy old Eros, he drops the arrow on his own foot, making himself fall in love with Psyche. Now he wants to ensure that nobody else can have her. And so what he ends up doing is whisking her away to this palace in the sky. And there we get kind of a Beauty and the Beast situation. He cloaks himself so that Psyche can't see him. And they have these dinners together and they chat together and they seem to be getting along well, but Eros doesn't want it to be known that this is him. But curiosity gets the best of Psyche and she sneaks over in the middle of the night one night and takes a quick look under the covers at who this masked kind of cloaked uh, man is. And she realizes it's the amazing God Eros. But accidentally, she drops some hot wax on him. Eros wakes, and he's furious that she's broken the rules. And now it's Eros's turn to run away from her. Psyche goes to Aphrodite to see if she can help find her son. Aphrodite, still a bit jealous, agrees. But only if Psyche can complete four nearly impossible tasks. First, she must sort a whole room of seeds and she does this by enlisting the help of tiny worker ants. Then, she must clip the hair of the fire-breathing rams of Helios, 
and she does this by waiting until they fall asleep at night. Third, she must gather water from the river Styx, and she does this by enlisting the help of Zeus's eagle. And finally, she must get the makeup box from Persephone down in Hades, and she does this by telling her own sad story of love and loss. And now that she's got Persephone's makeup box, there's one rule to go along with it. Just like Pandora, do not open the box. And once again, Psyche's curiosity gets the better of her. And she opens the box, and what comes out? But Hypnos, the god of sleep. And Hypnos puts Psyche into this unbreakable, long-lasting sleep. And finally, Eros comes around and finds her sleeping on this deserted beach. And he tries everything to get her to wake up. And nothing is working. And finally, when he's relegated himself to just having to deal with the fact that their love is over, he plants one last kiss on her. And just like Sleeping Beauty, Psyche awakens. And uh, they share a wonderful embrace. And this is so wonderful that they go together up to Olympus and all the other gods are so impressed that they make Psyche immortal. So this has a wonderful ending and maybe true love really does conquer all. Our final story revolves around Aphrodite and the mortal man in Chises. It is told in the Homeric Hymn to Aphrodite. And a quick note on that, when we say Homeric Hymn, we don't actually think that Homer wrote these. In fact, we don't know who wrote them at all. But they're written in dactylic hexameter, the same meter as Homer's epics, and thus the name. Okay, but back to the story. So Anchises is on Mount Ida, tending his sheep, when Zeus decides that he's going to have a little fun, and he's going to have Eros uh, go shoot Aphrodite herself with an arrow and make her fall in love with a mortal man. Guess that's what you do for fun if you're an Olympian god. After falling in love with him, Aphrodite pretends she's a Phrygian princess from the land of modern-day Turkey. She seduces Anchises, and for two weeks they have a hot and heavy passionate affair. Anchises has his suspicions, but it's only at the end of this that Aphrodite reveals who she really is. This man just made love to the goddess of love. Now Aphrodite tells him not to tell a soul, but come on, he's just hooked up with Aphrodite. Nobody, even in this made up world of mythology is going to play that down. Anchises finally starts boasting about it and Zeus hurls a lightning bolt at the poor guy blinding him for life. Now, nine months later, Aphrodite does give birth to the Trojan hero, Aeneas. And as Troy's burning during the Trojan War, Aeneas escapes with his dad Anchises on his back and his son Ascanius on his leg, and he sets sail across the Mediterranean. And after many trials and tribulations, he eventually ends up on the shores of Italy. And his children's 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 children end up being the famous Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome. And their children's 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 end up being uh, Julius Caesar and his adopted son, Augustus, who not so uh, subtly hint at their divine ancestry. So Aphrodite certainly is the goddess of love. But what we learn is that maybe love, especially passionate love, isn't the best thing to base a marriage on. Might just get you embroiled in a 10 year long war. And we also see this idea of patho or persuasion or agreeable compulsion at play when it comes uh, to women in the ancient Greek world, that they should go along uh, with things like a marriage that maybe they're not super into for the sake of their family and for society more generally. So while love might seem nice and, and delightful, uh, it wasn't all fun and games. Just a few lessons you can take away from Aphrodite, goddess of love.